Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, from snowball to snowman. So a little bit of a, a background on this is just that uh, uh, when the uh, when Team Rocket first uh, released the uh, the paper, it was titled uh, "From Snowflake to Avalanche." And uh, that, of course, goes over the partial ordering uh, DAG-supported avalanche consensus. And uh, this is basically explaining how we went uh, from that to support linear state machines uh, with snowman consensus. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be able to clear up a couple things. This will be fairly technical, um, but hopefully it'll be fun. So. Uh, a little bit of background about who I am, because I bet a lot of you have no idea. Um, so my name is uh, Stephen Budolf. Glad I remembered it. There's my picture down there. Uh, I'm uh, employed as the chief protocol architect at Ava Labs. So uh, basically work on um, developing new protocols, implementing them in the real world. Uh, my, uh, my kind of actual job is the, the lead developer of Avalanche Go. So uh, anything kind of consensus based, networking, P2P, uh, crypto. Uh, I have my fingers in, in a lot of places, so uh, I definitely like like uh, uh, like the area, and so I couldn't pick just kind of one spot. Um, I uh, kind of already covered that, and in my free time, uh, I like to uh, basically talk about random sampling algorithms. Uh, it's actually my uh, my go-to interview question. So if any of you guys apply as an engineering role, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a a little bit of alpha leak there, do, do some research on some sampling questions, and, uh, and it'll go pretty well. So, um, In this workshop, I'm going to try to avoid just presenting memes. Um, I, I won't lie, I did the uh, last third of this on the flight here, so there was no internet. So there, there might be less memes at the end, but uh, I, I tried to get them in when I could. So. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, binary snowball consensus. So this was actually talked about in the uh, in the original Avalanche paper. Um, we're going to then go over multi-value uh, snowball consensus, kind of different ways that that can be approached, um, and some potential problems with naive implementations. Uh, we're going to talk about the multicolor problem, uh, which people might not know about now, but I guarantee by the end you will uh, you'll at least know the name. Um, we're going to talk about binary decomposition for Snowball, um, pipeline voting, and uh, then we're going to talk about snowman consensus at the end. And hopefully, we'll have enough time to uh, talk about some oracle properties of Snowball, um, which uh, is, is kind of a, a unique property of, of Snowball consensus that really most consensus mechanisms don't provide. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's kick it off. So. Uh, binary consensus. Let's, let's just start with what actually is, is binary consensus. Uh, binary consensus uh, is, is basically answering a, a question with, with two options. Um, you know, for example, the, the legendary uh, you know, red color, blue color, red pill, blue pill. Um, similarly to the movie, uh, in consensus, there's really no... Uh, There's no, oh, oh, there we go. There's no correct answer. Um, you really just need to pick one of the, uh, of the values. In consensus, you typically don't care. You just want to make progress. Um, and, and the definition of making progress is actually deciding on a single value, in this case, either red or blue. Um, so how does Snowball solve this problem? Well, uh, first, my clicker works. Uh, Initially, the, co the, the nodes pick a color arbitrarily, either red or blue. It doesn't matter. There's no correct answer. Um, nodes then attempt to adopt the majority color by subsampling, so repeated subsampling of the network. Um, imagine you look around in a room. You see you know, a bunch of people wearing like, you know, a red hat. You want to switch to the red hat because it's more trendy, um, something along those lines. Um, even if everyone split 50-50, the network, just due to random perturbations, eventually converges to a single value. Um, and this is all kind of covered by the original uh, Snowball paper. So let's do a, a real quick kind of example here. So in this, uh, in this case, we have a perfectly split red-blue network. Um, 
the red node here is going to sample these, uh, these couple nodes. So it samples two blue nodes and a red node. And so it ends up adopting the, uh, the blue color. And it's going to uh, the whole network is going to repeat this sampling until eventually one color is selected. This ends up working great. And this is kind of the foundations of the, the avalanche consensus system. Now, um, what happens when you try to do multiple values? So we've actually seen uh, some different implementations uh, attempt to, to do, um, do this, this uh, form of consensus, um, where basically, rather than just uh, selecting between two options, I don't know where I need to point this thing. Uh, you know, rather than selecting just between red and blue, you have to select between, uh, a, you know, for example, a deck of cards or perhaps, you know, extremely large number. Um, now, uh, this ends up This ends up eventually, hopefully, picking the uh, the correct or the uh, the you know network selected uh, choice, but there's no real correct answer again. Um, so how could Snowball you know try to solve this problem? So if we try to follow the the same exact thing we did before with binary consensus, first off, nodes pick a random color. Uh, nodes attempt to randomly subsample from the network. My clicker works. Uh, but in this case, because, you know, there's so many colors, nodes might not actually sample a majority in the network. So if we look at this graph now, instead of having just red and blue, we have, you know, a bunch of various different colors here. When we end up sampling this, this, uh, these nodes, there is no actually uniform, you know, majority anymore. So this node doesn't have a better color to adopt. It maintains its own. And we see that nothing is really making progress. So in this case, we can see that just naively throwing snowball at multi-value consensus doesn't end up actually working how we want. So this ends up actually being what we call the, uh, the multicolor problem. Now, don't worry. There's a lot of options to solve this. And I'm going to kick off about five of them as we go in. Um, so the multicolor problem can essentially be described as uh, the, uh, as the number of nodes uh, that share color go down, uh, it becomes extremely hard to actually converge to a, a single value. Um, and whenever I try to face uh, you know, a problem, I typically try to avoid it, um, as I think most good engineers do, to be honest. Um, but uh, so the idea here is, well, we have binary consensus down, right? Like we, we, we figured out how to do that before. That's in the original paper. Um, so let's try to, uh, you know, reuse that using uh, what we call a, uh, a binary decomposition. So what we end up doing is we split the, uh, the value, the potential value space in half repeatedly um, and pick uh, which side or which half based off of binary consensus. Um, now we can just keep repeatedly having these sets over and over again until there's only one value left in these sets, and then we can decide on them. Uh, so if we look at a, a graphic of this, uh, we start with our 10 colors that we had originally, same exact 10 colors. Uh, we could maybe decide, well, we pick the right half of these colors using binary consensus. Uh, we then pick, say, the left half of, these, uh, of this, again, the left half, and we've decided on a value. So we can see, and this is a bit of a trick just in uh, normal consensus literature, that we can perform multi-value consensus just using binary cons consensus repeatedly. So um, on the avalanche network, the values that we're voting on are actually hashes, 256-bit hashes. Um, so we can partition the space bit by bit. Um, so here's a very simple two-bit example. So in this case, we have four potential blocks, block 0, 1, 2, and 3. The first bit is going to determine whether or not it's uh, a smaller valued block. The second bit is going to, or the, the first bit basically can either be smaller valued or larger valued if it's a 0 or a 1, right? 
So in this case, we can see that we can perform these, these multi, uh, multi-color step by just running three concurrent uh, binary snowball instances. Now, in order to confirm uh, a single multi-value uh, decision then, a 256-bit decision, that would mean that you'd have to perform at least 256 uh, consensus decisions, right? 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 Yes. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, one might ask, is that expensive? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so um, now, I, I, I said earlier, you know, when you're facing a tough engineering problem, try to avoid it. I lied. Okay, sometimes you can optimize the shit out of it. So um, a key realization here is that, in fact, when you have 256 bits, most of the bits don't actually have conflicts. Uh, in expectation with, you know, with you know, hash-based you know, algorithms, uh, the, first, uh, the first bits might have a lot of conflicts, but um, as, the, as the number of uh, prefixed bits match, the, in expectation it becomes significantly less likely. And in fact, having a, a conflicting bit in the, uh, in the last hash position is actually just as unlikely as having a, a hash collision, which... Bitcoin, Ethereum, basically all other networks almost dismiss as, as impossible. Not quite, and I think uh, Peter Schlage in the back would, would yell at me if I, if I said that, uh, that that was the case. But anyways, um, so let's revisit our two-bit example, but this time uh, with only three blocks instead of four. So we can see here, by the way, this clicker is working now. I don't know. Anyway, jinxing it. But um, so we can see here that we have these three blocks. If we perform uh, if we perform consensus on on this this side here, um, we'll actually see that this block is pretty much already accepted, right? Like if there's no conflicts here during the process of voting for less than two, we can almost immediately just accept block zero. Now, if you end up you know accepting on block greater than one, you'll still have to perform that other two. But because it's hashes, it ends up being you know randomized logarithmic. So we can vote over branches. Bits without conflicts get accepted very quickly. Oops. Um, now, one thing that to kind of watch out for is if you're voting over branches, you might think, well, if I'm trying to vote over this branch one, branch two, branch three. I'm voting over three branches. Isn't this just the same exact thing as the multicolor problem? How are you actually solving anything here? And the reason why is that if you vote for branch on block two or block three, you're still making progress on block greater than one. So you're still always making progress on the, uh, the most significant bit that's left to be decided. But uh, in the case that you have basically no conflicts, you can essentially skip those rounds of polling. So this takes us into, into snowball consensus. Uh, rather than selecting just a, a single 256-bit value, we can actually keep selecting bits, right? So previously, we were talking about like a two-bit example. Uh, now we can go to the full 256-bit. But rather than just going you know, to that level, you can, in fact, just do n bits, keep deciding bit by bit, and then chunk the bits into blocks. So uh, you can see here, uh, again, I ran out of time. Uh, I wanted to insert, insert a, a meme here at the, at the end, but I was on the plane, so I apologize for that. Um, but essentially, what we can end up seeing is that uh, we can end up chaining these, these uh, binary decomposition snowball instances together, chunk by chunk, um, and eventually create a blockchain. So we see this, uh, uh, this binary uh, decomposition for a snowball instance uh, ends up essentially representing height one, height two, and height three. So I think I still have plenty of time. So 
uh, for Snowball's Oracle properties, uh, um, we, we'd said at the, at the beginning of this talk that you know, we never really care about which, uh, which values we end up deciding on. Nodes pick them arbitrarily at the beginning. Um, but if nodes select their value based on, on an opinion, the, the same uh, guarantees that ensure Snowball finalizes actually guarantee that the network's majority opinion gets incorporated into the chain. So for example, um, uh, if say 80% of the network originally prefers you know, red, then red is guaranteed to be accepted over blue because of that overwhelming majority. Um, so I think uh, a very good example of this, which is something that actually happens on uh, Snowman Network, uh, is uh, specifically on the P-Chain, is uh, was node X online for greater than 80% of the time? So this is the reward calculation that we use um, in order to reward validators when they unstake on the Avalanche Network. Uh, so the actual online percentage isn't uh, necessarily defined by the blockchain. What it is defined by is uh, how nodes perceive each other during the querying process. Uh, so nodes might actually disagree. Nodes might think, you know, uh, you know, Aaron was up, you know, 60% of the time, but you know, someone else thinks Aaron was up 90% of the time. So what we end up doing is we perform a uh, a consensus instance, a binary consensus instance, over yes or no. So we can see that. Uh, you know, in this case, you know, maybe 80% of the network says Aaron was up 80% of the time, 20% say he wasn't. Uh, because Snowball ends up converging to the majority value, uh, we're actually guaranteed that uh, Aaron is going to get his rewards. Um, so I had, a, I had a couple programs set up to run, but I don't think that it really fits in this venue. Um, so I think instead of like running some simulations and uh, and going over things like that, I think maybe we could uh, open it up to a, a couple questions, uh, if there are any. Uh, I see one hand in the back already, but. Yeah, no, so that's a very, so are you, uh, are you asking questions about uh, as the percentage of the, val like as the number of nodes in the validator set goes down compared to the rest of the nodes in the network? Is that what you're asking? Cool, yeah, so, um, so, the way that this the, the way that Snowball works. Uh, so I guess the the question is is you know in the in these situations we have you know ten nodes we're sampling three of them you know you end up getting a, a great kind of idea of how how the network actually looks per, by performing these samples um, as the number of nodes in the network increases. Say we have a million nodes, are we still going to be sampling three people? The answer is uh, actually technically yes, um, and uh, the reason for that is because of uh, sampling statistics. So uh, in, uh, in most statistical studies that, that people ever you know, read about, look up, uh, you're talking about a population like, say, like the United States. I have never gotten a survey on whether or not I prefer red or blue bubble gum, but I guarantee that there is a, uh, a survey out there that you know says that United States citizens, you know, with high probability prefer X, Y, Z, whatever. I don't know. Um, and the way that they do that is they they sample, you know, like a thousand people, and they can, you know, say, well, as the the size of your sample converge uh, is like slightly larger, you end up getting actually a uh, uh, your variance in your sampling ends up converging extremely quickly towards the actual population norm. Um, and so, in reality, you don't have to sample more validators. Um, what we actually do, like, there is a minimum kind of number that you have to sample in order to get like a a, a good baseline. But then it's it's actually independent on the the size. Now, 
what isn't independent can be like you know gossip times and things like that and and so as the the number of, of nodes in the network uh, increases you will get like a logarithmic you know uh, slowdown in like your latency of gossiping things which can then become the bottleneck uh, but uh yeah I, I I hope I answered your question. Um, yeah. Cool, yeah, uh, Ray. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll just repeat it so that everyone, everyone can hear it. So the question was, uh, with, these, uh, with these Oracle properties, um, what is uh, preventing someone from, from lying, right? And saying like, you know, act like Aaron was up 80% of the time, but I'm just gonna say no, because I, I don't want to give him money or whatever, and try to bias people in that direction. Um, that's definitely possible. And so Snowball is, is a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus protocol. Um, so what that ends up meaning is, uh, this is not going to necessarily work with a 50-50 majority, right? Like if there's like 51% of people that say yes and 49% of that say no, there is no guarantee that it's going to go to yes, even though that is the majority. But if there is a significant enough bias, uh, then it's impossible for that ever to be pulled back. Um, so uh, that's basically the the uh, the BFT result on like the safety of performing a decision in Snowball. Essentially, there is a, uh, I forget the term was used, there's like a, a point of no return on the cascade. And so if you initialize at something like 70, 80% of the network in one color, um, depending on your Byzantine fault tolerance uh, parameterizations, you're already past that point of no return. So basically you are guaranteed to, to skew that way. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I tried. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. On, we got a competitor. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, I'm just um, Yeah, no. So, uh, so definitely, Snowball has um, like uh, theoretical liveness. Uh, I would say concerns when there's. Uh, multiple conflicts. So if you actually look in the original Avalanche paper, um, there is no, uh, no guarantees on liveness for uh, conflicting transactions in Avalanche. And specifically in Snowball, the time it takes to converge to a finalization is based off of the, uh, the number of Byzantine nodes. So in order to guarantee liveness in a, like a logarithmic number of steps, in expectation, which isn't guaranteeing, but whatever, um, you know, you can only tolerate like a square root n number of Byzantine nodes, and then, uh, you know, in order to guarantee the number of steps, like in like you know linear, you know, it's a, it's a different like requirement, and so on and so forth. And eventually, it gets like exponential. Um, so we're actually working at Ava Labs, and I was I was thinking about adding this at the, at the end, um, but. I felt like it was it was too uh, too currently in the works, but we're we've been talking about this for a long time, which is frosty consensus, which essentially uh, um, is able to detect when there is a liveness failure that is occurring and perform a expensive step to move past it. Um, so, yep. Uh, any other questions? Cool. Oh, we got one more. So um, in asynchronous safe consensus systems, uh, you cannot uh, guarantee safety and liveness to more than uh, one third Byzantine nodes, right? Um, that is actually tunable uh, if you wanted to say prefer safety over liveness, right? So uh, rather than you know guaranteeing 33% uh, safety liveness, you could maybe guarantee like uh, 50% safety and 20, okay, I, I, like 20%, you know, uh, live or wh whatever. You know, you can you can play around with the, those numbers. So um, in Avalanche, that is configurable, um, and in fact, actually, 
individual nodes can configure that however they want. Um, but uh, there are, of course, default values, which I think the, uh, I'd actually have to look up the, the default safety liveness parameterization. But, uh, but yeah, so, so uh, essentially Snowball uh, allows you to tune those values. Uh, but yes, like we're not beating the, any theoretical like bound. Unfortunately, that'd be a probably a you know well, that wouldn't be a great paper because it would just be wrong. But anyway, it's like yeah, great question. Thank you. Anything else? You got one over there. So I think the question was, what was the number of nodes required to perform a safety failure? Um, so, I, like, I, I would need to to check again the, the default parameterization because I believe most nodes are running the default parameterization. I believe the default safety parameter is around forty percent um, right now. Um, so that would be, you know, the amount of stake, which I think is uh, a couple hundred million of ox times 40 would be the, the, uh, the number, so. Cool. Anything else? Sure, actually, uh, so I was, I was going to, I was thinking about, oh, I don't know why I picked up this clicker. This was a terrible idea. Um, yeah, I, I'm calling that, calling that off. So, um, so, Snowman plus plus for for uh, uh, yeah so a brief history so Snowman plus plus essentially limits the the block uh, production to a, a list of proposers so when the network first launched when the Avalanche network first launched on Snowman uh, based chains basically anyone could propose a block at any time uh, now we talked about that linear uh, number of uh, of or that uh, log n number of consensus decisions that need to be performed if there's conflicts. So if there's, you know, uh, you know, eight conflicts, then you have to perform, you know, whatever, like three, um, you know, consecutive decisions in order to filter out those conflicts. Um, in Snowman++, uh, we reduce those number of conflicts. So rather than, you know, a typically seeing, you know, eight blocks proposed for each height in after Snowman++, there's basically one. So what Snowman++ does is it, it optimizes that log n uh, slow down even more. Um, so that, that was basically the, the, the key idea behind uh, Snowman++. Um, yeah, so that, that's how that, that fits into this. I don't know if that answers. Yeah, cool. How's it going? So um, subnets generally, so uh, subnets do not impact the security of other subnets. So if you uh, wanted to run a subnet with a significantly higher safety parameter, or you wanted to have a, uh, a subnet with a significantly higher liveness parameter, then you can configure that, and it would not impact the safety of the primary network. Um, so generally, that. That's uh, how that works. Now, when you get into a cross subnet world where you start, you know, talking about like, oh, like this asset was minted on subnet A, it was moved to subnet B. How does how does that all work? Essentially, um, the subnets define their their security model, and the users um, are essentially buying into that security model. So, if a subnet A is allowing assets to be transferred from subnet B, then uh, the assets from subnet B on subnet A. Uh, are only as safe as as both subnet A and B, right? So, I don't know if that. I think that makes yeah. Cool. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think time-wise is probably gonna be the last uh, last question. So uh, just just throwing that out there before we, before we finish. Uh, but uh, so there's a number of different ways that you can do cross subnet interactions. So I know uh, currently. So to clarify, currently there is no native cross subnet interaction that is supported by um, Avalanche clients. Um, what that means is people do alternative ways for uh, for performing cross subnet interactions. So there's like uh, some EVM to EVM bridges that have been being thrown around to use with subnets. So those solutions um, do not touch the P chain, right? And those are valid solutions. Like those are totally fine. It's uh, it's basically an out of band, you know, normal bridge. For example, the uh, the Avalanche Ethereum bridge. That's how that works, right? Um, there are definitely going to be more secure options uh, that involve uh, guarantees on the the uh, subnet validators um, and perhaps the the primary uh, subnet validators as well, um, which would give stronger guarantees on the safety of transferred funds. Um, and I personally see in the future that there's going to be um, not just necessarily one um, type of protocol, but a number of different protocols with different guarantees based off of the, uh, the, uh, the transfer that's occurring. Um, so that, that's basically where I'm at. I, there's, a, there's a whole litany of like, things to talk about here uh, for sure, but, uh, but yeah, I, th I think we're kind of at time and, and, uh, and it's all like kind of TBD. So. Awesome.